Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Yeah, we try to pray for the lost and uh, to pray for revival every time we meet. I think that's something that as priests, we want to really bring the burden of souls before the Lord in our Holy Spirit evening. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ in us, the hope of glory. I wonder how many of us have uh, put up gas before in our home and what was your experience mm. like? Uh, a week ago, we have uh, a couple of weeks ago, we have uh, somebody who stayed with us. And um, I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, whenever this person would in the next room would come out to the toilet, uh, <clears throat> I, 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 I would hear footsteps and sort of like in my semi uh, consciousness, I, I was aware, yes, there's a, there's a guest uh, in my home. And uh, when you have a guest, you also think about, suddenly you think about, oh, is there enough food in the fridge? And what about breakfast and so on? I mean, we are not uh, mourning about this. It's a privilege to uh, have has hospitality and so on. But it's inevitable that when we have a guest, we are very conscious uh, that we have somebody staying uh, in our home. In fact, we try to make our home tidier. I mean, I'm not really the tidiest person on earth, my <laughs> wife can tell you, uh, but um, I try to be, I try to be, I try to be tidy, okay? And, um, but you know that in the scripture, there is a guest in our hearts. And so if uh, now we're going to share the scriptures from uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. And here Paul wrote, he said, God, God may grant you to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. It's a Microsoft word. So I'm telling Solon to the Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. Or, or something else has translated that Christ may settle down and be at home in your hearts by faith. So Christ should be uh, in the home of our hearts. How about Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 23 said, He said to his disciples, if, if a man loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And what happened? We will come to him and make our home with him. So here again is the expression that uh, Christ, in fact, with, with, with the Father, uh, will come and make our home inside us. And I wonder whether we are conscious, really, with this so important the guest as the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Or is it that we live our Christian lives without even being aware uh, of this important guest in our hearts? I wonder. Sometimes out of sight, out of mind, it can be we have left our guest in, a, in, in his room for all these months or years even. <coughs> but worse still, we lock him uh, out. After all, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, he says, um, <clears throat> Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This Jesus say, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to his house, obviously, to him and eat with him and he with me now normally this uh, this verse is used by uh, you know evangelists to talk to the non-christians that yes jesus is knocking at uh, the door of your heart but really if you look into the right context this verse is really used for the christians so again it talks about christ coming he, he longs to have that intimacy uh, with us uh, he desires to spend time with us and so I wonder whether we are really conscious or not. And tonight, I just want to remind ourselves, Christ in you, Christ in me, the hope of glory. How are we treating our guests all this while? There was a book written some years ago by Robert Munger, M-U-N-G-E-R, called My Heart, Christ's Home. I'm trying to borrow some of his concepts there. And the basic Robert one day realized that wow jesus actually lives in my heart i have to intro uh, i have to treat him special i have to introduce christ to my home or my heart just like when my guest came i have to show him around 
all the rooms in my in my home as my bedroom. Right. So, so in this case, uh, Robert realized that he really had to make Jesus comfortable at home. And you know that in our home there are many rooms. And uh, so the first room that uh, he introduced was his study room. And uh, he said, oh, there were some magazines, a little bit sleazy magazines on the table. He said, he was quite red faced because he said, uh, I'm, I'm embarrassed to show Jesus the sort of magazines and books that I, I, I read. And of course, in, in today's uh, uh, equivalent, perhaps you have to show Jesus what sort of uh, uh, internet, uh, the history of our internet browsing, the links that we have been watching, what sort of stuff are we reading? What sort of films have we been watching? How long we draw on them is something perhaps we need to uh, share with our guests, with Jesus. And what are the pictures hanging on the wall that our minds constantly uh, remember and relish? And here uh, in his book, he said Jesus actually uh, replaced some of these pictures with his portrait. I don't know how, what Jesus looks like. And Jesus instead, uh, in fact, show him uh, scriptures to meditate upon. So what's your study room like? What's my study room like in my heart? A second room was the dining room where all our desires are served. What makes us feel good and happy? And here, uh, Robert says that the menu is not about, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I'm a little bit creative, it's not about steaks, it's not about your Sunday rolls, it's not your duck and so on, but our degrees, you know, our bank balances, uh, our wealth, maybe second and third homes. Um, our own house, we're proud of it. Our investment, flashy cars, make, uh, beautiful bodies, our makeup, designer clothing, holiday brochures, uh, bookings at restaurants, all these things. And Jesus shared with him and said, I have food that you do not know. My meat is to do the Father's will. So to put the pleasure of the Father above all these other pleasures. And so it, the book, you know, carried on and, 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 and the author took, him, Jesus, to different rooms, one by one. And then to the living room, where there's a sofa, there's this warm fireplace, and Jesus said, look, I'll be with you. I'll be here every morning. Let's read the scriptures together. And sometimes you find that he was so busy in the morning, he just had to rush off to work. He just saw Jesus sitting there, and without even saying good morning or goodbye, he just went off to work. And I wonder whether we also have left our guests. We, not, we have not spent time uh, with Jesus. And often you may see this plaque in many Christians' homes, right? Christ is the head of the home, the unseen guest of every meal, the silent listener to every conversation. But actually, when Christ is in our hearts, He actually talks with us. He's not just listening. He wants to engage with us in a conversation. And um, so Christ living in us, in our, in our home, even in our toilet, uh, there was a description of you know, the, the, there was a foul smell coming out of the toilet and, and, and Jesus said, look, you know, I can make it clean. And this guy was so embarrassed because inside, obviously, are all the unclean stuff in his heart. Uh, that there's things, really. And, but he allowed Jesus to unlock the, the, the toilet and Jesus went in. And the moment Jesus went in, there was a fresh fragrance that came out, even from the toilet. So the question is, how many of the rooms of our hearts have we really introduced our guest, Jesus into. Now Paul also writes on this topic about Christ living in us as a mystery. In fact, it started off with um, uh, looking at what, uh, Colossians 1 verse 27. And here he says, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Paul refers to Paul refers to this as a mystery. And of course, uh, the, the mystery that uh, he talks about in 1 Timothy 3.16, he says, which is not in the, in the, in the, in the list, is that God was, without, he says, God was uh, great indeed, we confess, is a mystery of godliness. That he, referring to Jesus, was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. So this mystery is not a mystery that is like a secret mystery. Only a few people know and you have to keep quiet. This is a mystery. But in the culture and the context, in the Greek of mysterion, it is talking about 
a mystery that there's no way you and I or human being can unravel unless God show it. That's the sort of mystery. And once God uh, reveal it, He wants it to be. He wants this this mystery to be proclaimed, to be broadcast to the world. And of course, before then, we we read uh, by one of the, some apostles. I mean, one of the apostles, a letter to say, you know, even angels, prophets want to peep into this mystery. What is this mystery? Well, the mystery is indeed that how can God become human being? That is a mystery. Uh, they, they would no way could anybody could have or angel can even think about that. And how can an infinite being can become an infant? How can the divine take on human flesh? How can uh, a human nature and divine nature uh, meet in one person? And how can the love of God would propel someone to take the sins of the world on the cross? And that through the death and the atonement, uh, that the sins of whoever believes in him can be forgiven. This is a mystery. Nobody could really understand unless God really showed. And God did, right? And, and, and then Jesus was crowned with the glory. He rose again. And this is the, 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 the other part. And now Jesus dwells in our hearts by his spirit. Christ in us, the hope of glory. So it's a reminder, even our church name, Emmanuel, God with us. So have you forgotten? You know, this, this, this mystery, formula of mystery, is really something is, that we should proclaim. It's really that the gospel, right? The good news that it's not just Jesus died our sins and we are forgiven, but there is this glory that Christ living in us, uh, the hope of glory. But of course, just having, you know, this image, which is very important and very good, and I've been practicing it, that here I see my room, I see Jesus, uh, sitting there waiting for me to talk to him, to pray to him, he's a great high priest, uh, to show me the scriptures together. I think it's such an important and, and something that we can mentally map, right? That Jesus lives inside the rooms in my, in my heart and so on. But actually, it may not be really completely accurate or even adequate to just visualize Jesus in the room because that is, yes, that's Jesus showing his Imminence, I-M-M-A-N-E-N-C, which means that God reveals himself uh, in a personal relationship to us in a fixed time, like now, Jesus talking to me or you within you know, that framework. But God himself is both not just imminent, but also transcendent. Okay, transcendent means what? It means that there's an aspect of the nature of God in Jesus, uh, his power that's not dependent you know, it's not bound by the physical laws. It's, it's gone beyond the material universe. It's beyond our human comprehension. Why? Because God is in full control. He has the power to do anything. He, he has authority over his creation because he's the creator. All this is transcendence. In other words, we cannot fully grasp God. It's like we live in a world of two dimensions, of stick man, trying to understand three-dimensional concepts. No way we don't understand. It's like an ant trying to understand the conversation of two human beings talking. It's not possible. It's, it's like uh, trying to understand how can Jesus talk to millions of people at the same time? How can Jesus at the same time can also uphold the, the universe while talking to me and you and all together and, and everywhere he's, he's present and he knows our thoughts. He, he knows when the uh, the sparrow falls is just cannot we just cannot understand so that is the transcendence right of jesus and we need to understand that when we have this guess in in us jesus is not just like oh it's just a human being but more than that he is the eternal omnipotent omniscient god and so knowing and appreciating who jesus is is very important because it shaped us of how we live our lives and how we understand the good news how we even understand the power of God resting in shaping the world as well, using us. And therefore, A.W. Tozer, he has a famous quote, which says, what, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So we have to realize that, you know, that our guests, of course, he knows the state of our rooms. We don't have to unlock he knows full well our motivations of our hearts and 
what goes on in our heads, our fears, our emotions. He knows the past, present, future. He's full of wisdom that even man may treat the foolishness of God, but yet it is the wisest, wiser than the wisest of man. And, and he is the one who can give us power in our jars of clay. Uh, he is the exact image of God and, and he sums up everything we know, we can know about who God is and his purpose. So he's the most powerful force beyond and within this universe. And he can wrap up heavens and earth like a roll of cloth. He can steal the storm, he can raise the dead, he can stop the sun in its tracks, he can reverse even time backwards, the sun can go back the other way. So he's not just an, another ordinary guest. So I think we need to understand that when we treat Jesus as a guest in our hearts, we don't make light. We don't treat the holy as common. Okay, we don't lead, treat the living bread as the common loaf of bread. So our relationship with him is a worshipper uh, to Almighty God, and yet we treat him with reverence as a friend, as he was or is a friend to Abraham and with Moses. So we don't take our guests for granted. We must be conscious of this all-powerful yet gracious friend who lives in the home of our hearts. And just as Ephesians three seventeen says that as Christ dwells in our hearts, he is the light, he shines in our hearts that we see the glory of God in the face of Christ. So have we been missing all these years that we are not even conscious of Christ dwelling in our hearts and, and to, to, to really experience the, the glory of God in the face of Christ? Because sometimes we often say, oh, last Sunday was, was powerful. And there is a manifestation of God when God's people come together. But how about, you know, when we have that communion with God, how come we don't experience that anointing, that sense of His presence, that glory? Because we should, because He lived in our hearts. And uh, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So, so there is something that happens when we meet with God, when we behold God in the home of our hearts. So what is this glory? What is this hope of glory? Well, we know that uh, this verse will say, right, quite most of, many of us may know that, um, that all men uh, fall short, all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Why? Because we, we broke the law. But now, when Jesus lives in us, it's different because the law, yes, no longer condemn us because God has acquitted us through what Jesus has done for us on the cross. But you know, the law cannot fill our hearts with the presence of God, right? The law does not, is not able to fill our hearts with the presence of God. But Christ can as he fills you and me with his spirit as we allow and let Jesus in to dwell in the heart. So the presence of God uh, presence of God live in our hearts and when Christ is in us you know then our thoughts our thinking are held captive by him so that we are able to have that freedom and the power to really surrender our wills of course it is progressive right it's not instant uh, so when Christ lives in us and has full you know fill us more and more we are able to um, let that glory of God come in that's why Paul can say I live and yet not I but Christ lives in me. And as the glory of God fills us the vessel, uh, you know, then there is that glory because Christ brings the glory of the presence of God in us. So, so we are earthen vessel, but the glory of God can be present in our, our, the hearts, in our hearts, which is the home. And that's why we are, you know, the, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, not only does the, the Christ in us brings the glory of God, the Shekinah glory into our lives, he, but His indwelling bring, brings blessings. We know that if you, uh, Adam's fall has brought curses and death, but Christ in us, because of the obedience of Christ in fulfilling perfectly the law, He becomes our life and because He obeys everything, He brings that blessings to Him. And the more united we are with Jesus, the more we are in God, in Romans 8, 11, right? The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, or dwells if it, the spirit of God dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life. So we will have life. We will have all this uh, blessing from God. And we know uh, that uh, 
as in Ephesians, that we're also blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Uh, and we will experience those uh, riches, not necessarily in money terms, but riches in terms of um, experiencing God's power in our transformation of hearts, in exp experiencing uh, the wisdom of God as we look back in our lives, uh, as we experience the, the judgments of God, how God you know, intervenes in situations, showing His mercy, experiencing His joy, uh, appreciating how inscrutable His ways are. So all these are the riches of God. And so to conclude, how can we uh, be made aware of this uh, unseen guest? I think we should be conscious now that we have been alerted that yeah, Christ lived in us, in our hearts. So don't just walk past Him in the morning. Uh, be aware, be conscious that yeah, He's waiting in our living room, wanting to talk to us. And uh, so, so don't treat Jesus like we treat our GP, right? We only call on my GP when I have a problem, when I have no problem, but I just leave Him alone, let Him attend to the affairs of other matters. But we should really learn to enjoy his presence. Uh, so as someone say, don't, don't have a theology of a parachute theology. In other words, we only call on Jesus when we are in an emergency. So there's a, a lot to learn because there's always joy in his presence. There's always pleasures uh, in his uh, right hand. So the more we know of Christ, the hungrier or the thirstier we should become. And that is like a bit of a... Um, uh, anomaly in a sense, right? The, the more we have taste Jesus, the more we want Jesus. And that's what we should, until we overflow with the presence of, of the glory of this guest in us, Christ in us, as the hope of glory. Of glory.